Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Looks good.
If I could uh, ask you to take your seats, please. If you could find your seats. We'll make a beginning in just a moment. If you'd be able to find a seat, there's lots of good seats down at the front, just like in church. Come on in, everybody. Well, welcome to Regent College, which is located on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam people. It is a real joy to see so many of you here tonight from different communities, the Regent College community, the Galliano Island community, the Arasha community, many others. I'm Jeff Greenman. I'm the president of Regent College, so I'll be your host tonight as the book launch event with Lauren Wilkinson unfolds. So first of all, before I introduce Lauren, who needs very little introduction in this, this, uh, this setting, I think, but I'll do it anyway, uh, I just want to say a little bit about our format for this evening. Thank you for being here in person. Welcome also to those of you on live stream with us. Glad to have you joining us. Our format is more or less the traditional one for an evening public lecture at Regent, if you've been to those, and many of you have. So after my introductions here, Lauren will speak for around 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have a time for question and answers, and well, responses anyway. Uh, and there's microphones in the aisle on both sides, so if you have a question you'd like to ask, uh, use those so that everyone can hear and those on the live stream can hear it too. So that's how we'll proceed. Then afterwards, uh, I saw as you were coming in, many of you were enjoying seeing one another and reconnecting. There'll be a chance also for that because there's a reception afterwards out here in the atrium. And then also Lauren will be signing books. Uh, so every author loves to sign books. Hint, hint. So uh, that's the evening program and it is just so much fun to see all of you here. So a couple of introductory words by, by way of background in a sense. Book launches are marvelous events. Uh, Regent has a long tradition of many, many book launches because lots and lots of our faculty for a long, long time have written many, many books. Uh, and you know, and the bookstore has a whole section just of Regent authors. Uh, it's a tradition of, of Regent faculty that takes scholarship very seriously and have been very productive contributing scholars as well as very conscientious and dedicated teachers, as well as very conscientious, dedicated, and dare I say, even loving mentors of students for years and years and years. Uh, Lauren has embodied all three of those, all in one, in his unique blend as a scholar and teacher and mentor, and one whose role at Regent has been for many years, starting in 1981, professor of interdisciplinary studies and philosophy. And that meant that he got to basically talk about anything he wanted to, teach on anything he wanted to, uh, indulge his very, very broad interests, and find a way to pull all the threads together. For so many of us in this room and so many generations of students, he was someone who helped everybody kind of pull the threads together of this Christian worldview and what it had to do with the bigger realities of our lives and world and the, even the whole cosmos, as we'll hear about tonight. So Lauren has played an incredibly important role in the history of Regent College, has had a great impact on so many of you here tonight, and that's why you're here. And as the longtime labor of love has finally been finished, we celebrate, whoa, yes. <laughs> we celebrate the achievement of this remarkable book, uh, Circles and the Cross, such a long time in the making. Lauren will tell you some of the story, and then he will talk about the main themes of the book. So let's have a warm welcome to Lauren Wilkinson. Well, thank you, Jeff. And uh, it's just so good to see so many old friends. In fact, it's it's good, but it's also going to be frustrating because I'd like to spend hours with each of you, and you'll just have to come out and visit uh, in order to, to do that, but not all at once. Um, <laughs> um, just a couple of uh, uh, preliminary comments on my part. Um, I, 
I went down to Oregon to visit my relatives, uh, and I haven't been there since before COVID uh, last week, and uh, um, caught a bad cold uh, going down and coming back. And uh, my voice is hanging in there, but it's, it's marginal. I might cough a little. I have a handkerchief. Yes, I have a handkerchief. I'll try to cough properly. Uh, it's not COVID. I've, I've been tested. Uh, I may take a few cough drops. I'm just, I'm just warning you. I used cough as my first word in Wordle yesterday. And got it in three. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Circles in the Cross. You see this book and its title. Um, Here are three quotes that stand at the very beginning of my book. Um, I hope they cast light on the whole argument. The first is from uh, the yeah. <laughs> the first is from Hans Verd uh, Erzon Balthasar's *The Scandal of the Incarnation*, um, which is an anthology of the writings of Irenaeus, that great second-century theologian, who was a kind of direct descendant of, uh, of the Apostle John, and he, he, he knew someone who knew John. He goes very, very back to the beginning. Um, this, is a, this isn't his words, but it's Balthazar's word. Balthazar is a, a Swiss theologian. The crossbeams are the world's center, and since it is in this sign that all creation is redeemed, they become the watermark of any kind of existence in the world. The uh, next quote, I, actually I'm going to go to the bottom, uh, is from Nancy Murphy and George Ellis, uh, a book, The Moral Nature of the Universe. Um, Nancy Murphy is a theologian from uh, Fuller. George Ellis, a mathematician and cosmologist from South Africa. He, they co-authored a book together. Uh, Ellis also co-authored a book with Stephen Hawking. Um, this is the concluding sentence of their book. Kenosis is the underlying law of the cosmos. You may or may not be familiar with that term, kenosis. It's based on the Greek word that occurs in Philippians 2, describing Christ who, in very nature God, emptied himself the uh, word kenosis translates, um, translates emptied. Um, emptied himself in obedience to the death of the cross. But these words, kenosis is the underlying law of the cosmos, are not from a book about theology, but about cosmology and human culture. The uh, final quote is from G.K. Chesterton. The cross, though it has at its heart a collision and a contradiction, can extend its four arms forever without altering its shape. Because it has a paradox at its center, it can grow without changing. The circle returns upon itself and is bound. The cross opens its arms to the four winds. It is a signpost for free travelers. Now, Chesterton's imagery of the cross and the circle take us to the title of my book, Circles on the Cross. They also take us to the Advent wreath. So think about these three quotes, I'll leave them up there, while I light the first candle on the Advent wreath. Some of you may remember that uh, in those many years when uh, I lived in my office at the end of the hall upstairs here at Regent for a few days a week, 
I lit the candles on our Advent wreath outside my door during Advent and was always grateful that the ever watchful Rick Smith, thanks for coming, uh, didn't make me put them out for fear of burning the place down. Um, last Sunday was the first Sunday of Advent, as most of you know. If you went to church on Sunday, the uh, service probably started with the lighting of an Advent candle. Um, maybe you have an Advent wreath in your home. How many of you do? Just in curiosity. Yeah, quite a few, yeah. Um, I brought this wreath from our dining room table, but I didn't bring it as a kind of quaint, cute, seasonal decoration, but because it does lead me into much of what I want to say tonight. Advent marks the beginning of the church year. Perhaps you grew up in a tradition where the church year was important. I didn't. In the conservative Protestantism that shaped my childhood, Christianity, I knew about Christmas and Easter, uh, which came around every year, but I don't think I'd even heard of Advent until the first Christmas I spent with the family of Mary Ruth, that intense and beautiful girl um, who was to become my wife. Uh, she and her family had spent a year in Germany when her father had a sabbatical to study with uh, Jeremias and Bart. The Evangelica Freikirche, she can correct my spelling or pronunciation, that they attended had a huge wreath suspended from the ceiling. That weekly lighting of a new candle, culminating in a Christ candle at Christmas, impressed them deeply. Uh, so the Advent wreath became a, a part of their Christmas tradition. That's where I met it. And it's been a part of ours for almost 60 years. But we can't really think about the Advent wreath, circle, four candles, Christ candle, um, without thinking about the whole church year. A church year is a very strange thing. It's about events that happened only once, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. They describe a single point in history, a crux, a crossing of God's time into human time. And yet, though the events only happened once at a particular place in time, in the church year, we treat them as though they are still contemporary as we cycle through the, the seasons of, of Advent, um, Christmas, ordinary time, Lent, um, and then long session of ordinary time. Um, this paradox is caught in the, in the shape of the Advent wreath, which also sketches the title of my book draw a line between each of the opposite candles um, of the wreath, and you have a cross. Extend the line outside the circle, and you have that ancient Christian symbol, the Celtic cross. Here's a picture of the Celtic cross outside our bedroom window. I, I feel a little guilty living in such a beautiful place, but Many of you have been there, so it's been good to show it with you. Uh, I'm going to read a bit about this, uh, this cross from the introduction of my book. Glasses. Mary, I th Mary Ruth and I have lived for more than 30 years on Galeano Island, one of the many islands scattered between Vancouver Island and the mainland Canadian city of Vancouver. I'm sitting at a window that looks out across our somewhat disheveled and uneven lawn. At this time of year, in the late winter of this mild coastal climate, the lawn is very green, dotted with dandelions and bluebells that are escaped remnants from the long-gone flower garden around the equally long-gone house built by the English couple who settled here a century ago. Because these islands are in the rain shadow of Vancouver Island and the Olympic Peninsula, the climate is very dry, for this part of the world. It's been called Mediterranean, and as the climate warms, people are successfully experimenting with growing wine grapes, olives, even lemons. 
We do not have the luxury of watering the lawn, so by midsummer it will be brown and dry. But the lawn is also the drain field for our septic tank. So by July, the sere brown grass of the lawn will be broken by strips and patches of rank green, vigorously healthy grass. I recall a book titled, The Grass is Always Greener Over the Septic Tank <laughs> by Irma Brombeck. How does such an apparently irrelevant and uh, irreverent detail fit into a reflection on the mysteries of cosmos, consciousness, and Christ? To answer that question, we have to dig a little deeper. A few years ago, when our septic system clogged up, with consequences I need not describe in detail, um, I spent several days of quite unmetaphorical digging to uncover the buried drain pipes, which were blocked by the roots of grass that, uh, responding to the available fertility, had gradually filled the perforated pipes. Near the end of the job, when the pipes were cleaned, reconnected, and carefully relayed in their gently sloping trenches on gravel hauled up from the beach, without a permit, I must say, um, <laughs> I took a picture to memorialize the hard work. Only then I noticed that the three parallel trenches holding the sewage drain pipes pointed precisely from the house towards that weathered Celtic cross at the edge of our yard overlooking Retreat Cove, the little bay in front of our house. The perforated pipes that distribute the waste from our house are buried in an ancient garbage dump, a midden. And they point to that old Christian symbol of the relationship between the cycles of life and the self-giving love of the Creator. Both the circle-centered cross and the sewer pipes in the lawn are good reminders that what we call nature proceeds mainly in circles, the turning earth, the circling moon, the cycling seasons, the tides, rainfalls, and rivers, the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen cycles of life, respiration, fertility, and decay, food, and sewage. The circle of the season turns the whole lawn green, then brown again. But just as the, 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 the circle of the advent wreath, the circle of the Celtic cross, reminds us of those circles of the natural world. Um, but the center of the advent wreath is the Christ candle. The center of the Celtic cross is the cross. Again, like the church here, a circle, like the cycles of nature, goes on forever, again and again and again. As we finish one year, we start another. But the incarnation is a unique event. It's scandalously unique. Sometimes the incarnation has been called a scandal of particularity. How can something that happens at one time and place be of such cosmic significance? What is the significance of the cross for the cosmos and our place in it? In a way, much of my life and much of my 50 years of scholarship and teaching has been an exploration of that question, as, this, as is this book. What does the singularity of Christ have to tell us about those two singularities we wake up into every morning? the mysteries of cosmos and consciousness, the mystery of the cosmos. Why is there something and not nothing? Uh, the mystery of consciousness. Um, why and how are we aware of it? Why is this collection of stardust, which is myself, an I and not just an it? Now, this book is not an autobiography. If it were, it would be dull reading. But it does touch at several points uh, on that lifelong personal quest to try to make sense of the prologue to John's Gospel, which describes this same paragraph, a par paradox. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Through him, all things were made, and that points to the cycles, 
to the cosmos. But then at the end of that prologue, um, the word became flesh and in Eugene Peterson's words, moved into the neighborhood. Um, so the, the Celtic cross, the advent wreath, um, the title of my book, uh, speaks of this paradox. How can the unique events around the, the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ be of cosmic significance? I grew up um, on the edge of the vanishing frontier in Oregon. Um, let me read a bit about my childhood. We'll get back to these issues in just a minute. Um, just across uh, 60 miles upstream from where the Willamette flows into the uh, Columbia, the Santa Am River flows from the Cascade Mountain Range into the Willamette. Ten miles up the Santa Am, the north and south forks of the river merge. A few miles up the south fork, just opposite the mouth of Crabtree Creek, is the half-mile strip of field, forest, and gravel bar where I spent the first 18 years of my life. My earliest memories are from that corner of the cosmos, where I first began to learn wonder that riverside forest of alder, ash, maple, cedar, Douglas fir, tall cottonwoods with herons squawking in the nests was a kind of Eden to me as a small boy. In the deep moss of the woods in the spring, there were white trilliums, blue violets, and purple bleeding heart. In the fall, as I write, um, a fleshy taste of brown morel mushrooms. Now, one of the things I did in Oregon was take a few copies of this book to my relatives. No fewer than four have contacted me since I gave them to this and said, no, they're in the spring. You only get, around here, the mushroom season is the, is the fall, mainly. But I should have known from my collecting mushrooms 60 years ago that it was uh, the spring and uh, my family, bless them, have reminded me. So that's one error in the book. I'm sorry about that. Um, in, in the summers along the river, I would wander upstream or down to hunt for lucid stones in the flood-churned gravel bars, blue agate, jasper, carnelian, petrified wood. In winter, after a warm rain, I would wake at night and hear the roar of the river as it carried the melted snow down from the cascades, spreading through the sloughs and across our fields too, and sometimes under our very doors. That was where I began to learn that creation was a gift and was very good. I knew from my Christian family, church, and summer Bible camps that nature was indeed creation. And thankfully, neither then nor later as I began to learn more of the vast scope and complexity of creation across space and time, did I feel that either the scientific story or the biblical story rendered the other untrue. Both were attempts to describe a mystery that was much bigger than either. I knew in my bones that there were two sources of revelation. One is in the story which the church year recalls for us, the biblical story culminating in Jesus. The other is that continual miracle of creation and our response to it, to which we wake every day. But growing up, I had very few resources for how to put these two sources, these two stories, together. The last old growth Douglas fir on our riverside farm, trees three or four hundred years old, 200 feet tall, six feet in diameter, were cut down to provide money to send me to college, first one in my family to go. There, I began to learn how to put God's two books, creation and scripture, together. For I was and am convinced that the scientific story and the biblical story must describe one world and not two. So this book, Be Warned, has an awful lot about the philosophy and history of science in it. After years of study and degrees in anthropology, literature, theology, and philosophy, 
Mary Ruth and I ended up teaching English at Seattle Pacific College. College then, now they call it a university. Um, but though we, we loved the teaching of uh, literature and writing, we were disturbed by the disconnect of, of what we were teaching, both from our Christian faith and from our, the, a, a, an awareness of the steady deterioration of the creation we loved. That was in the early days of the environmental movement. We remember the first Earth Day in 1970 when I was still a, a doctoral student at, at Syracuse University. Let me read you a bit about that. Um, earlier in the winter of 1969, our family discovered a beautiful waterfall in the Onondaga Hills to the south of Syracuse. But as the snow melted in the spring, we discovered that the gorge that held the falls had for decades been used as a garbage dump. Indignant at the desecration of the place, um, we, uh, we bought a rented a truck, brought a lot of plastic bags, and organized a group of similarly motivated students from Lemoyne College, a Jesuit school where I was teaching a freshman English class, to help clean it up. So that, but in upstate New York, that first Earth Day, April 22, 1970, began with a thunderstorm and heavy rain. So we reluctantly canceled the project. The sun came out by afternoon, but by then it was too late to organize the cleanup. Perhaps that quixotic non-event on the first Earth Day was somewhat emblematic of much of the environmental movement. For even if we had succeeded in hauling off a truckload of crash, a trash, we could not have removed the decades of old appliances and car bodies resting underneath it. Moreover, the problem was much deeper than layers of garbage, something both Aldo Leopold, whom I talk quite a bit about in the book, and Lynn White had seen very clearly. Leopold concludes a San County Almanac with a plea for building receptivity into the still unlovely human mind. And Lynn White concludes his famous 1967 essay, The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis, by saying, um, more science and more technology are not going to get us out of the present ecologic crisis until we find a new religion or rethink our old one. Lynn White's essay has become famous, but it's usually used against Christianity as evidence of the danger of the Christian idea that we humans are made in the image of God. But that's not reading his essay carefully. White was himself a Christian, and he recognized that Christianity implied a much richer view of creation than calling it simply natural resources. He pointed beyond the majority voices of Western Christendom to St. Francis, whom he suggested should be called the patron saint of ecologists. Uh, a couple of popes ago, that was made formal. <laughs> And he pointed to Eastern Orthodoxy as resources for rethinking our old religion, is his phrase. And in a sense, I've been following White's advice. Um, the environmental movement itself could be called an ethic in search of a religion. And I've been looking at the various religious options explored by that movement finding them moving in the right direction as they say we need to believe in something but we can't accept Christianity because it's so obviously failed. Um, as I say, many of them are moving in the right direction. One chapter of my book, Looking for a New Religion, is about that. But they're sadly inadequate. And at the same time, I've been rethinking my old Christian faith not coming up with something new, but recovering what is very old. And that very old Christian truth is caught, again, in the symbolism of the Advent wreath or in the Celtic cross, as a picture of the self-giving love of God at the very heart of creation, what von Balthasar calls 
the mark of any kind of existence in the world. Early in our teachings at Seattle Pacific, some large houses, which the uh, college owned on the coast of Whidbey Island, became available for teaching use. And so in our second or third year, we moved there and started an environmental studies program. It perhaps was the first Christian environmental studies program anywhere. We, we lived and cooked and ate with the students we were teaching. That was an experience that forever changed our life. Uh, and it was there that we began to see more clearly the significance of the incarnation and the cross which it implied for all of creation and for our life in it. As a Christmas present to one of the groups of students in that program, Mary Ruth calligraphied for each one on pieces of driftwood um, this poem, which I wrote for them. Um, it's trying to express some of the ideas from which this book has grown. Not in the waves, nor in the wave-torn kelp, not in the heron by the lake at dawn, nor owls haunting of the wood, nor rabbits browsing frightened on the lawn, neither in the widening whirl of seashell, galaxy, or cedar burl, nor in the mushrooms bursting of the humid ground, in nothing of the bright, shy world may God the fathering be found, if not found first in Bethlehem, in thistly hay, on hoof-packed earth, where a girl, cruciform with pain, grips manger boards in childbirth. There, in the harsh particular, in drafts and stench of cow manure, the squalls of Christ, creator, sound. Where God grasps not at Godhead in a child, there only will the God of life be found. Now, if we upon this wave-shaped bluff stand in the straw of Bethlehem, then God shines out from everything, the agate in the surf, the withered flower stem, the fish that gives its body for the seal, the flesh that fruits that form each common meal, the dance of pain and love in which our lives are wound. Since God was flesh at Bethlehem, in all the world's flesh may God be found. I was still groping for a way of expressing the relationship of the particular event of the incarnation to the timeless cycles of nature. But that's a way of putting it, what is it, almost 50 years ago. After three years of, of that very intense experience uh, living with students, we went to Calvin College to participate in an interdisciplinary research project sponsored by the Calvin Center for Christian Scholarship. It was a very rich time deepened my understanding and appreciation for Reformed theology. And out of it came the book, Earthkeeping, Christian Stewardship of Natural Resources. Natural Resources was the uh, title of the subject we were given to work on. But it was only when that group of scholars came together 10 years later for an updated version of that book that we realized what a short-sighted title that had been. To begin with, um, the stewardship we called earthkeeping, Mary Ruth invented that term as a parallel to housekeeping, uh, uh, it was not just a Christian task, it was the whole human task. But more seriously, it was not natural resources we were in care of, but creation. So the second edition of that book was titled Earthkeeping in the 90s, Stewardship of Creation. But by then we were at Regent College and had moved to Galliano, where increasingly we were trying to teach students about creation and our place in it. So over the years here, I've had the privilege of working with some very fine scientists and theologians, some of whom were my students, but also including folks like um, uh, Walter Thorson, um, uh, 
um, John Polkinghorn, um, the, the Torrances, um, Jim Houston, Jim Packer. And at the same time, I was trying to teach courses both in the nature of art, the nature of human thought generally, philosophy, and the philosophy of science. All this while I was groping towards an understanding of what the incarnation meant both for creation and for our place in it. Um, I had two or three sabbaticals in which I promised that I would pull all that thinking together. The presidents and deans and boards of regent were patient with me, but it didn't really produce much until it began to come together about 25 years ago when I had a sabbatical at St. Andrews in 96. And I was doing some reading on, on the backgrounds of Celtic, uh, Celtic Christianity, and I'm very cautious about that. Celtic Christianity is not a particular kind of Christianity, it's just mere Christianity with a greater emphasis on some older truths like uh, the importance of the Trinity, the closeness of God to creation. But I was, was doing some reading about that, and in the process, um, we came, about, came across a, uh, a uh, invitation to join a pilgrimage. Let me read about that, because in a lot of ways, that's really where this book began. That spring <laughs> in St. Andrews during the week before Easter, we, Mary Ruth and I, joined one of several groups of pilgrims, each group carrying a full-size cross across the borderlands of England and Scotland. On Good Friday, we converged at low tide to walk barefoot across the sand and mud to Holy Island, Lindisfarne, a center from which much of northern England and Europe were evangelized in the 7th and 8th centuries. We'd learned of the pilgrimage by accident off the still young internet, decided at the last minute to join it, caught up with the cross-carrying walkers a couple of hours late on a cool Sunday morning a bit west of Lanark near Glasgow. We did so with considerable trepidation. Though the language of being pilgrims and of bearing the cross had been a part of our evangelical heritage, actually carrying a real cross for a week through a countryside could easily seem in our more Protestant moods pointless, fanatical, corny, or all three. In fact, Mary Ruth said, if anything too weird happens, I'm going home. <laughs> Yet it was none of these things. And I remember vividly my thoughts when, during a period of silence, I first took my turn among the three persons carrying the cross. We were walking down a country road, across a stone wall on one side, new lambs nudged their mothers for milk. A forest lay ahead of us. Behind us on the horizon was a gray hint of metropolitan Glasgow. Clouds and contrails marked the blue sky. We were vividly, vividly present in a vast physical reality, a human world shaping the earth. But somehow the cross we carried became its center. The man-sized frame of timbers we carried was only a stylized copy of that instrument of torture. But in the atmosphere of prayer in which we moved through the Scottish countryside, it nevertheless silently forced the question, what does this emblem of the love of God have to do with God's creation and our place in it. Perhaps this book, Circles on the Cross, was born on that Scottish country lane. If the cross is indeed at the center of creation, giving it both life and meaning, then many mysteries become clearer. Reflecting on the image of the cross at the center of creation and consciousness can help us answer many questions. What lies behind the infinitely improbable miracle of the cosmos? It's as improbable scientifically described as it is religiously described. What lies behind our ability and desire to even ask that question? Why does human consciousness concern itself not only with where the next meal is coming from, but with the wonder that gives rise to art, science, and worship? What does the new story of creation that science is telling through cosmology, evolution, biology, and neurology have to do with the old story of creation by a loving God 
whose character Christians believe is most clearly seen through the suffering of a man on a cross-shaped instrument of torture. What might it mean for science that in the incarnate logos we can begin to understand how the cosmos is made and holds together? How can the work of an all-good and all-powerful God be seemingly so full of destruction, suffering, and death? If the creation is indeed to be understood more as the work of God's love than of his power, why has Christendom so often missed that point? Why do many Christians continue to leave creation out of their understanding of, of salvation? Now, when the power of humans and their technology seems to threaten the flourishing of earthly creation, how ought we live the meaning of the cross? And how might we convey that meaning to the many thoughtful people who, affirming the multiple meanings of the circle, deny or ignore the meanings of the cross? Carrying the cross to Lindisfarne was a long rock through the Scottish landscape. In this book, we will carry the cross through some of the landscape of history, science, and theology. And we will begin this second long rock from where we stand, not only at the center of the cosmos, but necessarily at the center of our consciousness. And uh, to illustrate that point, I'm going to show a, a, a few minutes from a film that many of you will have seen called Making Peace with Creation that uh, my good friend uh, and former colleague Ewan Russell Jones, a, a BBC filmmaker, made uh, as a great act of, of faith. Uh, it was a film about this book, which was six years from being completed. Uh, <coughs> But one section in particular, I think, uh, is, is relevant to see now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show this. It's about a seven-minute clip. an essential aspect of our relationship to creation. Not far from Galeano, over on Vancouver Island, is the historic Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. When it was opened in 1918, it housed one of the largest telescopes in the world. Until recently, there was a visitor center here called the Center of the Universe. That title may well reflect a book by the British astronomer Bernard Lavelle, which talked about humanity as being in the center of immensities. And there's a sense in which that's certainly true. Of course, we know the universe is enormously huge, and yet it's enormously intricate as well. So we can go out billions of light years. We can go down to the infinitesimal, infinitesimally small. It actually happens that um, between the biggest thing in the universe, which I guess is the universe, and the smallest thing we can measure somewhere down in, uh, down in, the, uh, in the quantum realm, um, we're about halfway between. We're in a very good position to look at the universe, both out and up at the very big, and in and down at the very small. I'm visiting the observatory with my friend Paul Thiel, who is an expert on the history of science. And we're very fortunate to be shown around by astronomer Dmitry Monin, who works here. That continues to be in use today every, every clear night. So for the first few decades, they did amazing work measuring sizes and masses of many, many stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, our, our home. So they did that and they figured the size and the mass, the total mass of our galaxy, it was actually done here. I study magnetic fields in stars. We observed a bunch of stars and we're still trying to figure out why 
there are some magnetic stars. Why they're there? Can I ask you what excites you about the work you do? The view of the uh, sky, basically. Because I remember when I was, I think, about five, that my, my earliest memory, I'm just laying down on the ground at night uh, in Siberia, in the middle of Russia, looking up at the sky. The sky is pretty much the same as here, right? And, and thinking, oh my gosh, all those stars, what are they? What keeps them there? And is there an end there? So when you start asking yourself that kind of questions, then you never stop because yeah. <laughs> there's no end to, to questions like this. So in some sense, the, the science is almost part of a bigger philosophical... It is. Even it religious is. kind of... It is. Of so this question. curiosity, curiosity moves you forward. You want to know what's up there and what part of that puts you where you are in that context. Yeah. Dr. Paul Thiel's research on the history of the development of science has focused on the role played by Christianity. He's found that for early scientists like Johannes Kepler, who discovered the laws of planetary motion, it was a Christian worldview, even more than the invention of tools like the telescope, that allowed them to make great advances in natural science. So this is the, the great, 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 great grandson of Galileo's <laughs> telescope. And Galileo, you say, was a contemporary of, of Kepler. Yes. It's, but Kepler didn't really make much use of the telescope, did he? He inherited use of the telescope. He, in, he inherited a whole collection of years and years and years and years of data collected by Brahe, Tycho Brahe. Kepler came up with his ideas about how the solar system would be put together and then went and tested it against the data. Kepler is a great example of that moment when culture is sort of pivoting from thinking about the world in Greek terms to thinking about the world in what we might call Christian terms or terms that take the senses very seriously. For the Greeks, anything that changes was not real and this world changes. And so what they were always looking for was an eternal idea or ideal. And with the rise of Christian theology, this world suddenly became a place that was real, that mattered. This was the location of the incarnation. Uh, suddenly history is a place where God is too. And uh, so that really made a difference to how we approach nature. It means that nature is now more a work of art than something to be decoded. And a work of art is just to be touched and tasted and smelled and looked at and loved. So that is how people started to approach the study of nature. As you would approach a work of art, in other words, you need your senses. Kepler really firmly believed that he was the first person to have actually seen this art for what it was, this arrangement of the sun and the planets. And he actually said in the prologue to his book, I don't care if, if there is no reader who believes what I've written here. It doesn't matter if nobody understands what I've discovered here. After all, God has waited thousands and thousands of years for an observer. What do I care if I have to wait a hundred years for a reader? He saw himself as maybe not the artist in residence, but the art appreciator in residence. God as the great artist and himself as art appreciator. There will be one, one more short section before opening up for some comments. I want to return to that uh, astronomical observatory um, because uh, it's a place that serves as a perfect example of our ability to 
um, respond with, in science, worship, and art. Um, a few years ago, Mary Ruth and I visited that observatory for the first time to hear uh, Vox Humana, uh, a very fine Victoria choir, which our granddaughter had recently joined. We gathered in the dome as the September sunset cast bars of orange through the narrow windows at the base. The singers entered, took their places in a semicircle around the looming tube of the telescope. As the silence settled, there was a grinding rumble and the dome began to open, revealing the twilight sky through the aperture for the telescope. The text the choir sang around the telescope in that observatory concert focused on the birth, death, and life of Jesus. Um, significantly, both Matthew and Luke's accounts of the birth of Jesus picture people uh, in, the, in, the, in the open, under the sky. The choir sang Gloria Patri by the contemporary Estonian composer Irma Sisak, who's also a Christian and an amateur astronomer. As we listen to the familiar Latin prayers and scriptures from the ancient Christian liturgy in Sisak's harmonies, the stars began to twinkle through the open dome. Sisak's Agnus Dei, Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, grant us your peace, ended with repetitions of the last phrase of this traditional Latin hymn, Dona Nobis Pacem, grant us your peace, spaced at increasing intervals, two seconds, then five, then 10, 17, 30. At first, the increasing silences in the starlit dark were unsettling. Was this Pacem the end, or would there be another? Later, I concluded after listening repeatedly to the piece that the intervals were probably meant to be roughly proportional to the space between the planetary orbits, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the asteroids, Jupiter. It was as though the prayer were reaching from us gathered in that dome outward into immensity. The choir finished, the aperture of the dome rumbled shut. We filed out into the darkness to an immense sky filled with stars. Sisak's three callings, composer, astronomer, Christian, beautifully underline the uniqueness of our position as conscious humans here in the cosmos, this center of immensities. The prayer, grant us your peace, is not an empty hope, and it's not addressed to an empty universe. The picture of suffering at the center of the Celtic cross under the advent wreath suggests that the true center of the universe is a God of love, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that crucified love offers the only possibility of peace. Now, I want to, uh, I want to end in just a moment and uh, give you a chance to respond. Um, I'm well aware that uh, what I've been saying is almost all prologue. Um, I haven't talked much about the substance of this book. But perhaps I've given you a framework in which you can see how its various pieces fit together. So before I read one final section, which describes the rather cryptic cover of the book, let me just walk you very quickly through the book's table of contents. Um, as you see, it's got uh, four sections and a conclusion. The uh, first section is about the mystery of being conscious in a cosmos. It explores consciousness and cosmos. And I, I argue that the basic human response to that mystery that we wake in, waken to, is wonder. And out of wonder grow the three great trees of human culture, uh, art, religion, and science. Science, for a variety of reasons, is the most problematic. And so the second section deals with science. First of all, the pleasures of science, delight and discovery. Second, the paradoxes. Science uh, being, through its largely Christian origins, as, as Paul Thiel mentioned, um, recovered the world as a place worthy of study because it was the place of the incarnation. But it also discovered the marvelous ability of mathematics to reduce it to law. And so there's a sense in which um, uh, science opened us to a, a reductionism to see things as only a kind of mechanism, 
to reduce us to a, 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 and, and the cosmos itself to simply uh, law-like interactions of a great machine. Uh, Kepler is a wonderful example of, of, of that, uh, both the good and the bad. And this has led to pains. First of all, the pain of power. Science has given us power, but it's also in some sense alienated us from the very world we study. But it's also enabled us to understand it. It's given us a greater kind of empathy. Um, next section, corrections, movements, and visions. Um, reaction against the kind of world that uh, science, that, that we have inherited. First of all, an attempt to build a culture based on that reductionism. We call it the Enlightenment, and we owe a great deal to it. But it simplified what we were, and so there were reactions against it. Uh, sometimes those reactions are called romantic. In the New World, the, the, in some sense, the Enlightenment and the romantic wor worldviews um, played themselves out, and they culminated in the 20th century in the environmental movement. Um, as again, I, I, I've described it as an ethic in search of a religion. Um, and the same, at the same time that science was revealing itself as not being capable of being reduced to law-like descriptions, it, it, the world that science describes is much more mysterious than the world that the Enlightenment thought it would, would be. Um, at the same time, uh, many are looking for, in Lynn White's words, a new religion. So I explore some of those religious options. Deep ecology, bioriginalism, and particularly its, uh, its emphasis on, uh, on indigenous religion, uh, ecofeminism, neo-paganism. I treat these, these contemporary attempts to find a, a religious core for our culture s sympathetically, but ultimately, uh, as I mentioned, they, they, they fall short. And so I shift to uh, some of what I've recovered, discovered in my years of teaching and research um, um, about Jesus as surprising news about the Creator. Um, in chapters, first on the Incarnation, then on the Trinity, and then on that centrality of kenosis. What does the cross, the self-emptying of the Creator, show us? So I have a chapter on kenosis in the creation, in the creator, kenosis in creation, kenosis in our own consciousness. How does the cross model um, not only taking, but giving? And finally, um, I end with optimism, pessimism, and hope living towards the new creation. I apologize for racing through that, but it's, uh, it took me 25 years to, to put it all down. You have to read some of it. Uh, I, I, want to, uh, I want to end by just simply reading a, a bit about the, uh, the rather odd cover of this book, which is based on this painting, which was uh, the centerpiece of the very, the very first show in what's now called the Dal Shandell Art Gallery. Um, it was painting, it was done by a, a, an Australian artist, Lindsay Farrell, who came here on a grant from the Queensland government to paint. Um, he made several visits to our place, was impressed with the place, impressed with the landscape of the West Coast, its, its similarities and contrasts, especially the contrast with the Australian landscape. And uh, he, the church he was going to, um, arranged for him to do a painting during Holy Week at the Oak, what's, Oak Ridge Mall. This painting was painted during, during, during Holy Week at the Oak Ridge Mall. It's called Easter Journey. And uh, in the, at the right, at the left, you see Retreat Island. You actually, you've seen it before. It's that island in front of our house. Um, but when he was visiting, there was a the climax of a long argument with, uh, about clear-cut logging in the province, and uh, 
So the center, the center panel is Retreat Island logged, Retreat Island clear cut. The, um, the right hand side is, first of all, it's an image of a lake that we'd hiked to up near the foot of Mount Baker, which he struck him as being odd because it was, it reminded him of the, of the, um, the rather barren desert lakes in Australia because there was no, it, the snow had melted and it was all barren around it. Um, and yet it was at the same time a body of deep clear water. Um, of course, that's one of the things the painting shows. But the painting also, and sometimes people, it strikes people with a shock when they see it, uh, of course, it's also something else. Because the clear cut of island is also the head of Christ. And the skyline are the arms of Christ um, em embracing the creation. And that lake on the, on the right is also the empty tomb, which is the ultimate source of, of our hope. The painting makes some allusion to a famous painting by Salvador Dali, Saint Christ of St. John on the Cross, which looks down. Christ is looking down, but he's suspended in a kind of Gnostic way above the world. In this painting, um, Christ is embedded in creation. He is at the center of creation, as the Celtic cross, as the uh, Advent wreath remind us. Those are the big ideas of the book. Um, I apologize for racing through them and only sampling here and there, but uh, I hope you get a chance to, uh, to uh, linger with them a bit if you buy a copy of the book. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. <laughs> that's all you're going to say until you start answering questions. So, questions folks. Or comments are fine. Comments are fine? Comments, yes. Comments are fine. Questions are fine, too? Comments are fine. Okay, comments, responses. Other things you might want to say, if you have something you'd want to share, something you'd like to comment on, something you'd like to ask Lauren, there are two microphones in the aisles. Feel free to ask away. I can't help but ask a question as these folks are formulating um, their thoughts. Um, some of us know that you're the one that introduced Regent College to Ian McGilchrist. And in 2016, he was the Lang lecturer right here. You were the respondent to that. Um, and I think maybe reading Ian McGilchrist slowed this book down some. It did. Yeah. It did. Can, can, you, can you tell us how, how McGilchrist's thinking has influenced your thinking and whether that shows up in the book? And you need yeah. to stand at the mic just so yeah, that people yeah. can hear uh, you. It, yeah. It's probably, uh, if, if you uh, remember this, uh, the outline, uh, the table of contents, uh, that section, the paradoxes of science, points to um, science. Uh, one of the things that science is rooted in is our ability to respond in newness to, to the, 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 the freshness of things, to respond to the world as it is. Um, but we also, and that's a, that's a part of our brain, we're made that way, to, to respond in, in, in love um, and empathy. But we also have a part of our brain that, is, that has to focus. It has to, it has to simplify. Science has been very good at that. It's been both very good at, at, at showing us the wonder of the world, but it's been also, um, it, it's, it's capable, especially as it's wedded to technology, to simply give us um, tools for using the world, for turning it into uh, not a great gift, but natural resources. And so, and what's so great about McGilchrist is he points out that these two things are, it's not that one is bad and one is good, it's that the, that, that, that ability we have to respond in love and empathy, to respond to the newness in things, um, should be the master, not the servant. We've reversed that in the last 500 years of culture. Um, we've assumed that the most important part of our, of our mind uh, is that part which can um, 
can simplify, reduce, and use. Um, and that's produced uh, the kind of world we're in. And that's been, a, that's been very helpful uh, in, in, in putting all of this together. Um, and I think it, uh, it, it can be put together very well around a Christian center, but you'll, again, you'll have to read that to find out how I do it. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Yeah, comment, question from up here. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Very much looking forward to reading this book. And I guess I'm curious, before I dig into the book, if you'd like to say a few things about uh, whether or not you engage in the book with the, the notion of, of, of a cosmic Christ or a universal Christ uh, or this notion of deep incarnation, right? This, you, you, you touched on it, right? That there's something unique about the center point of the cross as a historical event on a linear timeline. But do you get, engage at all with this notion of deep incarnation that, you know, the great flaring forth, so to speak, is when the incarnation begins rather than in the particularity of the person of Jesus? I don't engage in it in the sense that I um, critique what seems to me the excesses and mistakes of that idea, but I do engage in it in the sense that I, that I try to express what seems to me to be the very legitimate um, idea that the phrase the cosmic Christ suggests, um, and that is that in, in, the, in, in, in the theology that, that I grew up with, and in the most Reformed theology, and it goes back to both Calvin and, and Aquinas, um, and is, is the, the majority view in, in Christian thought, the incarnation of Christ is a kind of um, emergency action on the part of God and a creation that's gone wrong. Um, without denying that the creation has gone wrong and that, and that the incarnation has become our salvation, our redemption. Um, there's a, another line of, of Christian thought which goes back, I think, all the way to, all the, way to, 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 to the, the passages in scripture which link Christ and creation, which says that creation, that, that the incarnation is not plan B for, for God, but it was in God's purpose from the beginning and that uh, in, in some sense creation is for the purpose of the incarnation rather than the other way around. Um, my problem with the many of those who talk about the cosmic Christ is that they suggest that um, the, uh, the incarnation is just one example of a, of a pattern that is, is evident in, 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 um, in other cultures, other religions, and I do I, I can agree with that in a sense, but I don't want to deny the uniqueness of the centrality of the incarnation. Um, I think again, the uh, John John gets it right. He begins not by talking about Jesus, but by talking about Christ, about the Word, um, and then, after saying nothing was made without without the Word. Um, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he begins this, this, this remarkable and unique historical story. So yes, I, I can talk about the cosmic Christ, but I do it cautiously because I think it's got to be centered on the, his, on the history of the incarnation. Great, yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, comment or question from over here. Lauren, I've been struggling to come up with a comment, and I don't have one. I hope you'll take a question. 25 years ago, when this book really started to pick up momentum, what was going on for you creatively and artistically? What was the juice of that momentum for you? <laughs> um, well, I think I tried to describe a bit of that in that, uh, in that sabbatical at St. Andrews where we were experiencing kind of the, the depth of the history of the, uh, the, the Celtic tradition, um, which I think kept alive some truths about, um, about Christianity, especially the closeness of God to creation. And 
Um, but I, I don't know that there was any particular thing. I think what, what actually, I, this gives me a chance to say something I, I, I wanted to say. Uh, <clears throat> about the same time that you and Russell Jones thought that the, the chaotic ideas of this book were worth filming, my, my good friend Ron Reed thought that the, the poetry I'd been writing occasionally uh, since I was, you know, since it, you know, for most of my life, some of it was worth publishing. And so he took the, he made, he, he, he put it together. And when I saw it as a book, when I had to put it together, and, and I saw Ron's wonderful commentary on the poetry, I, I realized you know, that's, this does hang together. I, I, it, 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 it's just, there's a coherent argument here, interwoven with my own life story. So I, I, I owe a great deal to Ron for making me see that. So thank you, Ron, you're sitting here. <laughs> um, other than that, I don't know how I can answer your question. I wish, I, I hope now I can, I can write more poetry instead of just writing. I love it. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, other comments, questions? Anybody? Ah, here comes one. Shout out to Ron Reed for uh, promoting the poetry and pulling that volume together. Remember when we did a little launch event around that here um, yeah. some years ago? So first of all, thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Regent, for providing the frame for that. And thank you for the true creator God for this gift that you've given us. Um, I've, I've finished the book. So there's a, you allude to the path that you took carrying the cross to Lindisfarne. But there's a lot more in the book about the making and the walking of paths and trails, especially towards the end of the book. And then you write about a clearing, that the paths yeah. come into a clearing. I read your book, I read your book as an exploration and a walking and a making of paths through science and art and theology and leading to a clearing. The book itself is a kind of a clearing. So my question is not to you, but to all of us. What are we going to do with this book now that we're going to read it and have read it? Are we going to continue the conversation? Are we going to make new paths and explore old ones and find paths into the rest of our lives, our churches and communities and neighborhoods? And you've given a great gift. I hope it doesn't just take up space on the shelf somewhere, but it, it motivates us to do something with it. Yeah, thank, thank you, Rudy. I, I don't, don't need to respond to that. You've asked the question. Um, although I do, it does make me a chance to just say a little bit about that imagery of the path, which um, is, is, a, is a good picture of a kind, a way of human thinking, which creates a, a space in which what's around it can appear. Um, I draw a lot on, on Heidegger here, um, but also uh, on, a lot on the, on the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins, uh, who says our, our task is to, give, is, is to be selvers, to give selves to things. Everything declares themselves, but we can allow other selves to have a space to appear. And a good metaphor of that is, is a clearing in being. But that's in the... Uh, Kenosis and Consciousness chapter. <clears throat> okay, other comments, questions? There being none, I'll ask the final question and then there'll be a reception and book signing outside in just a minute. So one of the things that the um, book launches of Regent faculty over the times I've noticed is how many uh, times the author notes that they've learned something from their faculty colleagues. And you alluded to this just a little bit at the beginning, but I wonder in, in the shaping of this book and how it comes together, what were maybe a couple of ideas that, that your faculty colleagues uh, shared with you or that you worked out together with your faculty colleagues over the years at Regent? Well, I, could, I can give it. It's another two, whole lecture probably, but. Two, uh, two sides to that in a way. I think, um, from 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 several of the um, the importance of God as Trinity, um, that God is a community of love inviting us into relationship. Think of that great uh, 
Rublev icon of the figures around the table. Um, Jim Houston, I think, uh, uh, the one that first uh, helped me think along these lines, but uh, many others, uh, Alan Torrance uh, in his visiting times and uh, other visiting scholars. Also, I, I owe a lot to, uh, to uh, biblical studies colleagues, uh, both uh, uh, Ian Proven and, uh, and Rick Watts, and sitting in and both participating in their classes, and especially the idea that creation uh, has to be, the, the temple has to be understood as creation. Creation is a temple, the temple is creation, and so much that the Bible says about the, the temple is really talking about uh, creation, God's dwelling place, and there's all kinds of ways that this uh, works out into a, a richer theology of the incarnation. Um, an another, another kind of half, I don't know if it's just, I, I, when I was coming, when I came to Regent to, uh, for an interview, really, to talk about whether Regent and I were a good match, uh, I met Jim Packer. We hit it off immediately, and we immediately, we fairly soon discovered that we had uh, two particular writers that we both loved. Uh, one was uh, uh, Charles Williams, and another was Gerard Jar Nelly Hopkins. And I mentioned that both of them were admirers of Duns Scotus, and Duns Scotus defended the idea that I just sketched briefly that the incarnation is not plan B, but it's in some sense God's it, it purpose from the beginning. And I remember Jim leaning back with his magisterial British way and saying, well, at least that idea is not heretical. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I never really did persuade him of that, but I, but I, but I think that tension, uh, it, was, it was a comfort to have Jim say it's not heretical, but it is kind of basic to what I'm arguing here in a lot of ways. Um, Okay. I think okay. That's <laughs> oh, that's On that note, let's thank Lauren for this. Right, one, more, one, more, one more question there. Let him ask it. Two, one more. Two, two more questions are. This, this is a comment. Um, comment. I, I spent many hours sitting in this room listening to Lauren, and uh, I know many people who are far away who would love to be here. And uh, so my comment is on this first night of Hanukkah, the festival of the miracle of the oil. And I just want to thank Lauren and Mary Ruth for their ideas, which have brought light to so many. And on behalf of those who I know would love to be here celebrating and uh, met you after you had started this book and have sort of heard and watched the labor um, of this book and your life and the work of your life. And to, yeah. so thrilled to celebrate it. And my only question is, how does it feel without that weight? on your back of this book. <laughs> now we can start cleaning the basement. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks. Yep, Christy. Um, I didn't have a comment before because I was just kind of sitting there stunned, to be honest, in the sacredness of this moment. And Rudy's comment about pathways through the woods and clearings I just want to name how you and Mary Ruth have made so many clearings over the years for so many of us, and how your, your life and your work and your witness has um, planted seeds is a poor metaphor. I'm, I'm thinking, cosmologically, thinking about, to be honest, omnicentricity and about how the bigness of the universe was present in an infinitesimal speck of the Big Bang, and how that's what you guys keep doing in the sacred spaces, in the clearings, in the woods that you have created through all your hospitality and all of your conversations. They've planted all these places in the universe that are gonna keep expanding and expanding and expanding with the richness of God's heart through the incarnation and you know, the withness and forness that is Yahweh working through all of creation in every moment as the universe and God's heart just keeps expanding. So. Thank, thank you for saying that. Bless thank you, you and thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Christy, beautiful. <laughs> So 
So we'll finish on that note from Christy. Thank you very much for being here. There is a reception. Lauren will be out there signing books. I need to get him out to the book table so that you don't trap him in this room. Enjoy one another's company, and thank you for being here with us tonight. You didn't even need a fisherman's friend, I don't think. Yeah, I'm glad I... You made it.